how many best picture Oscar winners can you name starting in 1990 mm -hmm. all the way through today? I'll give you one hint. Mm -hmm. um, there are 33. 33. Of them. Okay. Uh, let, let's let's start with with most recent Coda. We'll go back. We'll do Parasite. We'll do Nomadland. Spotlight. Um, Twelve Years a Slave. God. Uh, let's go to Titanic. Let's go to um, Argo. Uh, oh man, I'm feeling miserably at this, and I call myself the awards ace. This is a problem. You're actually uh, doing great. <laughs> so I got to think. Okay, great. so the thing, obviously, okay, what should have won? I can tell you right now, just doing this list and what already annoys me that I'm doing this, that I'm thinking that. The Social Network did not win Best Picture, and for that, the whole thing just makes me just want to. Ah. I mean, this is you're talking about a film in my estimation that's perfect. So when you when you watch The Social Network and you find out the King's Speech won Best Picture over it, that just makes me furious. Why do you think that is? Because there's so few films that we see that are truly spectacular across the board, really exemplary. In every single aspect, and when you watch the Social Network, you're looking at a film that obviously direction, screenplay, cinematography, score. The Reznor Ross score is is I think that's the cherry on top. That's what makes that film the true masterpiece that it is. Is that it's the choices that Reznor Ross did in that score from that opening scene when he's walking across Harvard Square. You say, oh my God, this is unique and this was not a choice that most composers would do and and the fact that Fincher allowed them to work in that space and create something again if you give that to any other composing duo composer singular you're talking about a different film because they're not going to come up with that score and I think that is really what cements that as a masterpiece but performances uh, everything in that film is is perfection and the fact that it didn't win best picture is again just I think it's got to be the biggest crime in the history of the Oscars the fact that it did not win best picture and then the King's Speech. What is it about that film? Or it maybe it's nothing. It's just in comparison. It's it, that's what it is. It, it's not about it's not about the King's Speech. It's about selecting. For me, it's 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 really about identifying what's the best film. What is the best film that we saw this year that hits everything that you're looking for? And, and I think when I watch a film, and I, I try to say I'm more of a film evaluator than a film critic, you look at it and you say. What are the aspects that shine here? What what is truly worthy of spotlighting this for an awards purposes? And when you watch a film like again Social Network, you you see it in every single category you're looking for. Literally everything, even production design, uh, which is lower down the list for that film, but it still creates a world which is very hard to do. Um, and I think that's one of the key components for, for any film is, is world building and that is production design. And I think that when you when you have a film that hits everything and it doesn't win, that's what that's the hard part. That's the thing for me. It's like yeah, it, it's at the end of the day it's just a trophy that says you you're the best film. Doesn't mean it is, but it should have been that film that year. And that's what I think it is. It's not about King's speech. It's about social network being truly perfection. Well, it's public acknowledgement too, uh, and, and, and acknowledgement of a group of sort of gatekeepers that say, "Okay, you're yep. worthy." And so, 2011 King's Speech. Did you know going in, there's no way the Social Network's going to win? No, I, I thought for sure. Listen, at the end of the day, you, you still have hope that they're going to pick the right, the number one film, right? And yours might be different, but overall, when you look at and you're, you know, you watch hundreds of films a year. And you see the one that is very clearly the best film. I mean, I go back. Obviously, they got it right with *Parasite*, another film that is true perfection. Uh, occasionally, uh, they are going to miss. It's just going to happen. It's just the, the law of averages are going to say that it's going to go to something else. I mean, this year I wouldn't have picked *Coda*, uh, 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 for sure. Um, I mean, I think I think *Coda* is is a very likable film. Do I think that it holds up to the, you know, when we look back at, at Oscars 2022, are we going to say Coda is filmmaking that is truly going to, you know, pass the test of time? I don't think so. Uh, I think it's a, it's a likable film, but I just don't think it hits again. When I watch a film, for me, it's really technical. It's so important to a film. The tech for me is where I really get dialed in. Like when I watch The Batman, I mean I see Matt Reeves and I say this is a director. When I go back and I watch Let Me In, 
uh, you just know that this is a, a, a person that has a skill that is extremely unique and they have a vision that is singular. And those are the things that for me, uh, as I'm assessing, you know, awards value for a film, you're, you, those are the films that you want to see succeed. So a director like Ty West, mm -hmm. oh. who's creative and edgy, will Love he it. ever receive an Oscar? Not for X. I mean, he's not. Gonna, he's not going to win for X. Uh, but when you watch, and I go back and I remember Innkeepers from Ty West, and I don't remember thinking too much of that film or the direction. But whatever happened between Innkeepers, roughly a decade ago, and X? I mean, X is when you watch that film, you are looking at a director who has again that skill that is and the artistic vision that most people don't possess. And it's, it could be a traditional remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, right? And it's not. It is, it's got so many layers to it. And I think the choices, the landslide scene in X, um, you know, Fleetwood Mac, I mean, that is truly, when you watch that film, the way it's edited, the way it organically flows from the film, uh, and just all of a sudden, he, he starts on the guitar and it, and it starts into the montage of Through the Years. It is, that is the best sequence that I have seen in several years um, as a singular sequence of a film, the landslide sequence in X. Uh, do I hope Ty West will be uh, a best director one day? Absolutely. And I think he, no question he possesses the skill, mm -hmm. uh, but he's been working in the horror realm. Let's hope, I know he's got Pearl coming up later this year. They shot him back to back, right? They shot the prequel and during, well, they shot X. So Pearl's coming out this fall. And uh, I can't wait to see that as well. But he's someone that's on the radar as somebody who, you know, going forward, I, I would not be surprised if this is somewhere we're talking about in the in the Finchers, in the Nolans, you know, the Villeneuve's. When we get up to that top level, Ty West is absolutely going to be there one day. Sure, sure. And he's still very young. Too. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I, actually, I don't even know how old he is. Yeah, I, don't I don't look, know. He's probably in his late 20s, 30s. But he's got such a, I think that's, when you watch a film, when, when I go to see films, you're, you're really looking for that, that talent that pops and you say, wow, this is again, remarkable skill and singular vision that the average person, you know, you see so many films and you see decent direction, you see above average direction, and then you see what Ty West did next. Um, or David Fincher in Social Network or any number of films, obviously from Fincher. But when you get to those, that, that level of skill, is is uh, that's the treat? That's the cinematic treat that we're all looking for. So, 1990, Driving Miss Daisy. Mm -hmm. 1991, Dances with Wolves. 92, Silence of the Lambs. 93, Unforgiven. 94, Schindler's List. 95, Forrest Gump. 96, Braveheart. 97, The English Patient. 98, Titanic. 99, Shakespeare in Love. 2000, American Beauty. 2001, Gladiator. 2002, A Beautiful Mind. 2003, Chicago. 2004, The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. 2005, one of my favorite, excuse me, uh, Million Dollar Baby. Mm -hmm. 2006, another favorite, Crash. 2007, The Departed. 2008, No Country for Old Men. 2009, Slumdog Millionaire. Mm. 2010. Danny Boyle. Oh. I, love, I love Danny Boyle. Yes, you do love Danny, oh. Danny Boyle. We have, yes. Yeah. You can keep going. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll come I back to him. I love Danny Boyle. Yeah, That's, yeah. A, oh my God. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're paying homage to Danny Boyle. Uh, 2010, Hurt Locker. 2011, The King's Speech. 2012, The Artist. 2013, Argo. 2014, 12 Years a Slave. 2015, Birdman. Yes. I okay. like Birdman. Mm -hmm. 2016, Spotlight. Mm -hmm. Love 20, Spotlight. Yeah. 2017, Moonlight. 2018, The Shape of Water. 2019, Green Book. 2020, Parasite. 2021, Nomadland. 2022, Coda. Coda. Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, overall, when you when you list off the when we go back to 1990 and you, you look at those films, I there's not a whole there's not a film in there that I say, wow, this is not worthy of being best picture. I don't see there's not one even Crash. I mean, listen, I'm not suggesting the Crash is is the all time best movie ever made, but I understand how people respond to the film. I think that's one of the, the things that you have to be able to do when you go in and, and you critique a film or evaluate a film is you're trying to, for me, is figure out what is the audience for this film? And do you understand how this audience for the film will be able or will not be able to embrace this film? And I think that when you watch a film, 
um, like Top Gun Maverick. Uh, you, you see it. I saw it you know, three weeks ago before it opened, and I said, this is a film that will be loved by 99% of the people that see it. 99%. Because it is that... It's, it gives you everything that you want for a movie-going experience, for the average moviegoer, right? Um, understand, the spectrum of moviegoers is extremely wide, and, and but, but at the end of the day, when you're talking about a film that's going to appeal to a large swath of the movie-going public, uh, y- you have to identify something like Top Gun Maverick is going to work. And it did. I said it's going to get an A-plus cinema score. It did, which means perfect word of mouth, right? That means people are going out of Top Gun Maverick, and they're saying, you have to see this film, which doesn't happen very often. That that true organic love for a film that spreads like wildfire because everybody who goes to see it comes run out and they become an apostle. Like, hey, you got to go see Top Gun Maverick. And that's what's happening. And I think when you l- look back at from 1990 on, to most of those films, most of those films have that. Even Coda, which I said I have plenty of issues with from a filmmaking perspective, it still has that aspect of word of mouth being strong where people say, oh, I really liked Coda. And you need to have that because that's, and King's Speech is that way. Uh, so you understand how that happened. People like the feel that the King's Speech gives you. Um, conversely, I understand how The Social Network is not an uplifting film, but it doesn't have to be. Like, There's no law that says films have to be uplifting. One of the things I love about a film from the past uh, two plus decades up in the air is the fact that it isn't a, a, a buttoned up ending in bow tie and everybody, he, he gets the girl. That's what makes up in the air the film it is. Same with La La Land, exact same thing. Is I think that's what makes the the film what it is is the fact that it's not a perfect finish to a film. But some audience people t- members do not like that. They want they want to have they want to go home feeling good, and so I think that's that will that's one why people don't like La La Land as much or Up in the Air. I remember my ex wife at the time was like, I hate it Up in the Air. Why you didn't get the girl? I'm like, that's why it's good. That's exactly why it's good. Where did you see the first Top Gun? In Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, I was I was uh, you know an '80s kid, and Top Gun came out, and it was. Listen, you go back to to the '80s, and you know, I mean, listen, we grew up a similar era, and and you you say to yourself, uh, what a difference it was back then, right? Because back then it was just you didn't you had three networks, okay, and PBS. We didn't even have Fox at that time. You had television, you had radio, that was it, right? And you had movies, and you went to a movie and that's all you had. So you had this, just everyone would talk about one thing, which we don't have as much anymore these days because there's so many choices to what you can spend your free time on, your entertainment time on. Uh, back then it was movies, network television, or radio. And when we would go to the movies and I saw Top Gun and uh, it, it just, you know, I was a young kid growing up. I'm like, I want to be like Maverick. I want to be that guy. And, uh, you know, this, the soundtrack, you kidding me? We all had the cassette. Not the CD. CDs weren't around. Not the vinyl. Although I had vinyl. Didn't have the vinyl of that. I had the cassette. Wore it out. CBS Records. I remember going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards on that thing. Because in the old days, for those of you who don't remember, the, the cassettes were a pain in the butt to go for the next song. You had to fast forward and then hit it perfectly at the right time. But, but that film was a phenomenon. I mean, it was what everybody was talking about. Top Gun was the thing. I remember being uh, in high school and they had the Top Gun... Uh, we had like assembly and and the cheerleaders went out there and danced to like two different songs from Top Gun. It's like, that's how big, it was a phenomenon, right? And it's hard to, to find that these days. And I think that's the magic of of 80s, of, of Top Gun or any real major film in the 80s. I'll go back and look at The Lost Boys. Oh God, Lost Boys. Um, you know, these are films that, that really shaped who I am. And I, we had so many great films in the 80s. I mean, I, I saw all these films in theaters too. Go back, E.T., Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, Aliens, uh, Cocktail, my God, uh, Cocktail for as, as, as absolutely fluffy, forgettable as it is, it is a film that I love. It's one of those guilty pleasures, right? And there's so many of those in the 80s. Um, but I mean, The Lost Boys was a film that I saw and I said, wow, this is cool. I just love, that's a film that is, if you had 20 best films I've ever seen, Lost Boys is on the list. 
even Vision Quest, and I'm oh, not yeah. a wrestling fan, yeah. but there was something about that opening oh. with the Journey song and that they're the bus, yep. and and it got you excited, oh, and yeah. and I feel like some of that's lost these days. But well, I, it, you know, you say that it's, it's funny, like you, you cocktail the beginning of cocktail, like you said at the beginning, the, the Starship song that that he gets on the bus and he's going off to New York to be this uh, big famous business guy. Um, is you remember those things, and like you said, there's just something about about the way 80s films were made. And I think that's what you, when you watch Top Gun Maverick, you see that, right? When you see what Kaczynski did at the beginning of that film with the intro, with the Top Gun theme bleeding into Danger Zone, it's that's an 80s start, right? It's just, it, here's your here's your credit scene, your, your beginning credit scene, which you don't usually get in film these days. And it was such a smart move. And I think that sets you up for everything it delivers. But the 80s were, I mean, uh, again, I, you could list a zillion movies, even going back to the you know garbage uh, slasher films. These are all the things that, that got me into film. Sure, and all the right moves. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, the diversity, right? The diversity. <laughs> Sorry. No, yeah. the diversity of all the films right, right. That, that we had in the 80s, uh, just, it was just anything goes. And I think that, um, you know, some people devalue 80s films and say they're forgettable fluff, they're this and that. Um, but but I think of so many, I mean, one of my favorite comedies of all time is Real Genius with Val Kilmer. I mean, he, he, the character that Val Kilmer is in Real Genius reminds me a lot. I often wonder, did Ryan Reynolds watch Real Genius? Because his persona, and I love Ryan Reynolds, I think he's great, he's, he's very good at that sarcastic, snarky guy, uh, very quick-witted. Uh, you go back and watch Val Kilmer in Real Genius, you're like, that is very much like what Ryan Reynolds is these days. I think Val Kilmer in Top Secret, same thing. He's just, Val Kilmer is such an underrated actor. Um, I think we're all coming around to that now with Top Gun Maverick and seeing him in the film and and certainly the documentary from last year. Uh, but, you know, Real Genius is just, uh, what a great comedy. I could, I've watched that film probably 30 times.